Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Institute of Politics. We are happy to have you all with us tonight, and we are thrilled to uh, welcome Mara Kiesling uh, here tonight to talk to us about her work and uh, transgender equality and everything she's been fighting for. Um, before the formal introduction, which Nicole will do, I just want to tell you about a couple things we have upcoming. On Wednesday, we will be having a conversation about free speech on college campuses. That'll be at iHouse at 6 o'clock, and we have a pretty spectacular panel put together for that of some of the leading experts on um, all sides of the debate on campus free speech. To Thursday afternoon at IOP, we will be welcoming the Council General from Israel, Roy Jalad, who will be talking about Israel today with Kate Grossman, our fellows, um, our director of fellows. So before we turn it over to Ma, I want to introduce Nicole Morse, who is a third year PhD student in cinema studies. Um, she's from Middlebury, Vermont, which is a place actually, I love Middlebury, so. <laughs> You're used to our winters, but that's prettier there. Anyhow, Mara is here. She's studying media production by transgender artists, and she, uh, Ma, I'm sorry. Nicole will be introducing Mara tonight. Nicole, without further ado. Hello, it's an honor to introduce you Chicago alumna, Mara Kiesling this evening. As the founding executive director of the National Center for Transgender Equality, Mara has been instrumental in making outdated government policies more inclusive for trans people. Her efforts have made it easier for many trans people to ensure that their gender is correct on government records, has increased trans people's access to necessary health care, and strengthened non-discrimination laws. Yet despite this progress, and despite the unprecedented visibility of transgender people in the media, violence against trans people, especially trans women of color, has been described as an epidemic in the United States. Furthermore, the hard-won legislative victories of recent years are under attack with dozens of anti-trans bills introduced in state legislatures this year. In this climate, Mara's work is as necessary as ever, and a quick glance at her Twitter reveals how busy she and the National Center for Transgender Equality have been. From South Dakota to Mississippi to New York and all across the nation, they are working toward a future in which this nation is inclusive of people of all genders. This evening, Mara is here to discuss the challenges facing the trans community, how political activism can affect social and political change, and the hurdles the transgender movement is facing. Please join me in welcoming Mara Kiesling, Executive Director of the National Center for Transgender Equality, back to the University of Chicago. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Nicole. Um, you know, this is the first time I've been on campus in almost 20 years. Uh, I've been in Chicago a bunch of times since, but um, I just haven't come down to campus. I went to school here 35 years ago. Um, I showed up in the first couple days of April in 1979 to, to, to start as a transferring sophomore. Um, and I remember the dates because it was, so I, I grew up in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, about five miles from Three Mile Island. And it was the week that Three Mile Island melted down. And I took a train to Chicago. Back then, trains were a lot cheaper than planes. Uh, and I took a train. And when I got here, um, I went to a payphone to call my family, and they weren't there. And it took me two or three days to find them. And I was starting off at this new school, which was a lot more intense than the Penn State I had been at. And uh, finally found them. They had. Um, decamped to Scranton, Pennsylvania to stay with relatives. Um, but I, so I was walking around today and it doesn't feel familiar. I, it's been so long, I guess. Um, I lived in Woodward Court for two years, which is now the business school. And um, it's gone. And I used to, my dorm room overlooked the Roby House. Um, and the Roby House is still there, but my dorm's not there. So I went into the business school, thought maybe I'd pick up some vibes or mojo or something, but I'm apparently allergic to business schools. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm really excited to be back here. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about um, what's happened in the last uh, 16 years, because it's, it's really amazing what's happened for trans people during those years. We hear a lot that the gay rights movement is the fastest moving 
movement in history, and we got them beat by a lot. Um, in, in 2000, I want to tell you about some of the things at the beginning part of this century. In, in the year 2000, there was not a single attorney in the country who, whose whole job was doing trans rights. There were some great attorneys who were doing trans rights, like Shannon Mentor at the National Center for Lesbian Rights, and Jennifer Levi at GLAAD, and Phyllis Fry in Houston. But there, there was no movement. Um, there really was not a trans movement. Um, to that point, government policies had been done without keeping us in mind at all. Um, they did what they wanted to do. We didn't have a voice. Uh, and so some of us really felt like we needed to have a voice. And 2001 is a really pivotal year for trans rights because that's when organizations started popping up. First, Lisa Motte went and worked at the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force and started their trans civil rights project. And then the Sylvia Vera Law Project started in New York, and the Transgender Law Center started in San Francisco. And then we started the following year uh, in DC. Um, but 2001, there's another really important thing that happened that was very formative for me. Um, I was meeting with Senator Robert Mello, um, who was the Senate Minority Leader in the Pennsylvania State Senate. And we were trying to get trans people into a hate crimes bill we were trying to pass. And he said, nope, no way. Um, if sexual orientation is in the bill, I can give you 17 of the 19 Democrats. But if we put gender identity in, you get zero. And then he looked at me and he said, but Mara, look on the bright side. Five years ago, I wouldn't have let you in my office. And that's a shocking yet true thing, he said. It, it, um, uh, you know, it really was true. Um, now, six to eight weeks later, I should say, we did pass that bill with gender identity in it. We got 19 out of 19 Democrats and 13 of the Republicans. Um, until last year, when Utah passed an anti-discrimination law, it was the only time an LGBT bill had been passed in a Republican House, a Republican Senate, and signed by a Republican governor. Uh, but Senator Mello was right. Five years before that, or thereabouts, I wouldn't have been allowed in his office. In fact, in 2004, uh, I was on John Kerry. I was on an LGBT finance group for John Kerry's campaign for president, and um, every month or so, they'd get some big deal to come and talk to us. And you know, one time it was Senator Edwards, who was the vice president candidate. Sometimes it was the campaign manager. And I would get invited to these because I was on this finance committee and because I was the executive director of an LGBT organization. They were inviting all of us to. The day that it was supposed to be Senator Kerry, mysteriously, I got taken off of both lists. They forgot to invite me. I didn't even know about it, except I was having lunch with another executive director. And she said, OK, you ready to go over? And I'm like, where, what? And she said, to meet with John Kerry. And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. And they were like, oh, yeah, sorry. The Secret Service can't vet you in time, so you can't come. But they purposely cut me out. Um, that was in 2004. I don't think Senator Kerry did, by the way. I think it was his nervous people. But it used to be, we used to have a thing called the flinch factor when a politician met a transgender person, did they seem warm about it, or did they flinch when they did it? Um, I had people early on who, members of Congress, who would sit, and then they would just sort of uncomfortably move away. Um, I was sitting with a state senator in Maryland once with uh, another trans advocate. And after about 15 minutes, he was like, wait a minute. You're one. You're one of them. Oh my god, you're one of them. This is so cool. And I'm like, yeah, you're not making it feel cool. Um, in 2005, we couldn't get Senator Ted Kennedy to meet with us. And we had to trick his office into having a meeting with us by asking the National Organization for Women to ask for the meeting. And they asked if they could bring friends. And they brought 40 friends, or, or 25 friends representing 40 organizations, including us. Um, and then in 2007, Congressman Barney Frank famously took Gender, we had been fighting for 20 years to get gender identity into the Employment Non-Discrimination Act. We finally got it in. He saw an opportunity to advance it in the House. It had no chance of passing the Senate. But he decided to take that opportunity. We asked him not to, and he did it anyway. And so we set him on fire. 
Um, not him personally, I mean it politically, but we, um, we set him and the human rights campaign on fire. Um, they had no idea what the movement had come to in those five short years. We had been um, fighting with our friends uh, and it was finally paying off. Um, and then I want to speed up to 2016. We just can't even control the two Democratic presidential candidates. They are tripping all over themselves to be pro-trans. Um, this is a good thing. I'm not, I'm not making fun of them, but they are doing pro-trans videos. They are having pro-trans positions. They're fighting over who is more pro-trans um, and who's been pro-trans the longest. Um, and so that's really cool. On the other side of the aisle, we have presidential candidates. Uh, the first two Republican presidential debates this year, both of them mentioned trans people. Uh, we've sort of made it. Um, so before I say this next thing, remember what Abraham Lincoln said, you can't believe everything you read on the internet. <laughs> um, there's a famous uh, inaccurate quote from Gandhi um, that apparently was really said by a labor organizer in Pittsburgh and not Gandhi, but it's pretty, this is true. Um, and some days I can remember the person's name, but, um, and he was a, a poet and labor organizer, by the way, which is, you know, kind of cool. Um, and uh, whoever it was who said it said, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. And for us, it's been more like they ignore us and we win. Then they laugh at us and we win. And now they're fighting us and we win. And now all hell is about to break loose on transgender people. The next two or three years are going to be um, ugly. They're going to be pretty bloody. Um, but um, it's because we're winning. And that's really hard for, for trans kids you know, an eight-year-old to be sitting in school saying, well, at least we're winning, and yes, everybody's disrespecting me, and I'm not allowed to use the bathroom at school, but heck, we're winning. Um, obviously, that doesn't matter to, to the eight-year-old or the eight-year-old's parents, um, but it, it really is just um, unbelievable that the forces against us, um, most of whom are former marriage equality opponents who are still trying to prove their relevance and their fundraising prowess. Um, there's one particular organization, the Alliance Defending Freedom, which has like 50 attorneys, and they're going to every school district in the country and telling schools, don't help trans kids, don't accommodate trans kids, we'll support you, we'll fight your legal battles. Um, and I can't for life of me figure out what it is other than they're trying to prove that they're relevant. Um, but picking on kids um, is, just, um, is just really outrageous. So for the last two and a half years, we've had these, well, let me back up and tell you how we got here, how we got to be winning. Our, um, our movement has been very assertive and very, um, and has taken a real sort of manifold approach where we're trying everything all at once, where we have a litigation strategy and the litigators who do trans work at organizations like Lambda Legal and the ACLU and the National Center for Lesbian Rights and the Transgender Law Center are phenomenal. Um, and um, they've been just winning all sorts of stuff with the litigation strategy. And then we have uh, a legislative strategy which has stalled. I don't know if you've noticed, but the US Congress, uh, yeah. Um, we've had a federal administrative um, policy effort which has been phenomenal. Um, we've had somewhere between 90 and 100 um, policy wins during this administration. Um, I'm totally a nonpartisan person. I don't care who wins elections. I do like saying that because obviously I do personally care, but we don't support candidates or anything. But I can tell you objectively that President Obama has been the best president for trans people and no one is in second place. Um, and all he's done is tell administrative agencies it's okay to do good trans work. You know, we don't have to be afraid of it. He has not, as far as I know, been personally engaged at all. Um, uh, although when I got to meet Michelle, um, 
she said to me, I'm so sorry, I know we're not doing enough trans stuff. We're going to get it done. We're going to get it done. We'll do more. We'll do more. And then she talked about a veterans thing, which I was surprised she knew about. So I was very excited. But um, it's been really amazing. And the public education has been amazing. Now, I look at trans work as being in three um, Venn diagram circles. Um, and if I could go to my imaginary chart here. Um, this circle is policy change. And that's really where our organization mostly works. And then this red circle over here, so now I'm assigning colors. I've, <laughs> I've actually never assigned colors before. This, this one is public education. And then the green one down here is services to trans people and emerging trans people. All three of these are really important. We mostly do this one and this one. We don't do a lot of direct services other than responding to people's questions. And um, uh, I want to pull up something in a second. Um, so we're, we're, um, we've been winning the policy. We've been winning the public education. The last two years have been almost bizarre public education-wise and public media-wise. Um, and it hasn't been one particular thing. It hasn't been Caitlyn Jenner or Laverne Cox. They have been so important. I don't mean to diminish their roles. Um, but it's just been a lot of trans people doing a lot of really great, um, a lot of really great work, public speaking and speaking to their local TV stations and speaking to their local newspapers. And that's really paying off. And I know a lot of us are seeing that as the next big thing over the next couple of years. We really want to try to increase the spokespeople, increase the, the breadth and diversity of the spokespeople we use, get a lot more parents involved. Um, parents are just awesome spokespeople. Um, but also get, where possible, some kids involved. That's always a, a dicier thing. Um, because you just have to be very careful about what you put a kid through that will be on the internet forever. And most parents smartly are apprehensive about putting their kids forward that way. But we want to get more people. We want to get more transmasculine identified people. Um, forever, the, the public and the media has thought about trans people as being people like me and Caitlyn Jenner, um, you know, people who are worth $100 million. No, I'm kidding. I have no idea what she's worth. I do know what I'm worth, roughly. And it is roughly $100 million less than that. <laughs> um, but um, we're, we're just doing this amazing public education. And now we're facing backlash. And it is, um, it is wonderful uh, and horrible and an opportunity and a crisis. And some folks are going to get hurt. And we're going to make progress. Um, your mayor, when he was at the White House, famously said, um, no, crisis, no good crisis should go unused or something. And so we are taking this. We, we have four things going on. If you go to this second chart over here, we have four things going on right now. Well, I better get back to the microphone or I'll get yelled at. Um, the chart might as well be here. It doesn't have to be back there. It's imaginary. So on the one hand, we have these really bad state legislative bills that are showing up. Basically, some right-wing extremist organization, Alliance Defending Freedom, is, is finding dupe legislators in a bunch of states to introduce these really horrible bills. And they're all slightly different, trying to try different things. They're just warming up. And they're trying different things. And we've, we've been able to beat them, we collectively, not, not just our organization, though we've certainly helped and tried to help. Um, but then also, there's a, a, a zillion school districts that are on fire right now. Um, there are a couple dozen that are in really, really bad um, conflict over trans students. And then there's hundreds and hundreds of other school districts who have done the right thing, and hundreds of others who have done the bad thing. And that's got to work itself out over the next few years. And we're all trying to figure out how to get the resources to the parents um, who have these kids um, so we can fight those battles. And then the third place where we have battles is ballot initiatives. We think there will be ballot initiatives in about three major cities this year. Plus, it looks increasingly likely that Washington State will have a ballot initiative. By the way, there is a, um, there, there is a, uh, um, is that my signal? Oh, OK. The signal person was moving. And I'm like, we didn't talk about what moving meant. <laughs> Um, 
I don't know where I was talking about. Ballot initiatives. So we think there's going to be a big one in Washington State. We thought there was going to be one in California, but they weren't able to collect up the signatures. Um, we don't know for sure that it'll be in Washington State, but that could be a five to seven million dollar problem. And the entire trans movement runs on about half that um, nationally. So we don't really have any idea what we're going to do there. Um, we now have presidential candidates taking shots at trans people around bathrooms. Um, sometime in the next few months, the Department of Defense is going to release its report outlining how transgender people can serve. And they're all, and, and Bernie and Hillary are going to be like, you're damn right, trans people should serve. This is great. And the Republicans are going to be like, the military is no place for social experimentation. These people are sick. Um, and we'll win. Um, I'm very optimistic about us winning, but you know the the things that trans people and particularly trans kids are going to have to hear is just pretty um, opprobrious. Uh, we're winning. We're beating these bathroom bills. None of them have gotten past us so far. We had the closest call yet in South Dakota. Who knows about this in South Dakota? Holy crap! We ha I said that, and it's being recorded. Mom, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, we had a really close, um, a close one in South Dakota. It, the, this bill, which would have required transgender students to use the bathroom at school according to their chromosomes. And for those of you who remember being a child, you always knew exactly what your chromosomes were because you had been tested multiple times. There's this sort of misunderstanding about sex that everybody is either XX or X. Y, I was going to say, or XO. <laughs> That's the huggy people. Um, XX or XY. Um, but the truth is, there's 10 or so other variations. And not everybody who, uh, I, I, I don't know which word to use, identifies as male or um, is seen as a male has the chromosomes you'd expect. So this is like a really stupid thing. And you know, if you ask any of the parents of trans kids, they'll be like, how am I supposed to know? And we saw a bill get introduced and then withdrawn in Louisiana last week that really would have caused a genital check at schools. Um, I just don't think anybody has thought through this stuff clearly. Um, well, we won, on South, we won in South Dakota. I think the, the movement. Uh, got to the governor and basically said, why would a state government that always talks about local control of schools decide to control schools in terms of who uses which bathroom? And the governor bought that. And he met some trans people. And it was humanized to him. And so he vetoed the bill. And then the next day, they took it up to override the veto. And they failed, which was the closest we've ever come. The one I'm a little worried about, honestly, is North Carolina. Um, Charlotte City two weeks ago, or last Tuesday maybe, either last Tuesday or the Tuesday before that, passed a local ordinance, uh, public accommodations anti-discrimination law. And the night before it passed, the governor was like, if you people do this, it's outrageous. And there will be predators in the women's room. And little girls are in danger. And I will demand legislative action. So they passed it. And the next day, the Speaker of the State House said, this is an outrageous overreach, and we must have state legislation. And then late in the week, the President of the Senate said, rah, 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 rah. <laughs> and so we're starting that. Their, their um, session starts April 25th. And we're, we're starting with the Governor, the Speaker of the House, and the President of the Senate demanding legislation. Um, so, so that's nice. Um, so that's a challenge. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm an optimist. Um, that one looks pretty hard. And the, you know, the North Carolina legislature has just been a national embarrassment for you know, the last few years. So I would expect nothing less of them. Um, but we're, um, we're getting this done. We, we're almost at the point now where trans people everywhere can get the ID documents they need. Um, most of you all who aren't trans identified just don't think much about what gender markers on your driver's license or by the way why there's a gender marker on your driver's license the only reason it's there is because there didn't used to be photos and then they never got around to taking it off and now the federal government mandates it cuz again it was before we came around our movement and our organization and we weren't there to fight that um but we'll get that dealt with too and then um 
we've been working really hard to eliminate um, health care disparities, in, in particular um, insurance, health care insurance exclusions for transition-related surgical care. Um, Fifteen years ago, there were no plans. Um, every now and then a trans person could, you know, dupe an insurance company or slip one by. I, I don't mean there was fraud. I just mean they got away with it. Um, but then the, everybody tightened down, and so the, our lawyers have gone after them. We've won legislatively. There's an anti-discrimination provision in the Affordable Care Act called Section 1557. Um, so we're winning that. Things are actually looking, in general, really good. We're on an upward trajectory, but right now we're plateauing and about to run into this bathroom brick wall. Um, and we see it as an opportunity to have a bathroom conversation with America, because everybody in America, including me, has been saying, let's talk about public bathrooms. It is, if I can say, totally freaking annoying, because there is not a single actual human being in the United States who is saying to themselves, every time I go into the bathroom, all the wrong people are there. <laughs> right? It doesn't happen. It's not a thing. But somehow, this Alliance Defending Freedom and these other groups have said, oh, yeah. And they use language like, um, big, burly trans women will follow young girls into the restroom. And it's, it, it's, it's really terrifying in a demagoguery kind of way for parents to hear that. And it's going to take us a while to educate past it. Um, we will educate past it. And in the meantime, we have to have this conversation with America about what bathrooms mean to us, who we are, and about our identities, like non-binary identities, identities that might not fit perfectly into a men's or a women's room. Um, but uh, um, last thing I'll say, and then I'm just going to pull over for questions. I want to tell you what public restrooms mean to trans people, because I don't think anybody but trans people really understand that. Um, if I am a 10-year-old in middle school, or would I be a 10-year-old in elementary school? I'd be a 10-year-old in elementary school. If I am told I can't use the girls' room, I can't use the boys' room. It's not like I'm uncomfortable using the boys' room. I can't do it. If I did it, I would be susceptible to all sorts of bullying and violence and things. Um, so if I can't use the right restroom, I can't usually go to school. And if I can't use the right restroom at work, I can't have a job. And I can't go to the mall if I'm not allowed to use the right restrooms. And I don't know why they're going after us on this other than it seems like an easy target to them. It isn't going to be an easy target for them. We are going to work our butts off and exact a tremendous price out of them. They just think this is a helpless, small portion of the population they can bully around. And um, we're going to, I mean this policy-wise, kick their teeth in. Um, and uh, we will walk out the other side with America better ed educated and none of these laws actually on the books. But I think, we're gonna, I think some of them are going to slip by initially, and we're going to have to fight to get them taken away, um, again, with litigation, with administrative advocacy, with political work, and public education. So I'm so excited to be here. I'm so happy to answer any questions. Um, let's talk. And who is the person with the microphone? Hi. <coughs> oh, sorry. Hello. So how do you want to do questions? Find people who want to ask them, and then I will answer them. I'm pretty ca I didn't mean that to be sarcastic. I'm just, I'm very casual. Hi. Hi. Um, I remember the bathrooms in Rickert and Flint as being very uh, different, by the way. But uh, we can talk about that after. We had, um, we had uh, co-ed bathrooms in Flint. Yeah. That's, that's right. That's right. Were either of you in Upper Flint when I was? I was in Rickert. When I was there? Yep. Who are you? Oh, hey, how are you? <laughs> you haven't changed so, as much as I have. Just like we had back home when we were growing up. Yeah, except when it was parents' weekend or something, we had to put the signs back up. And then we never, we didn't really. Yeah. So the question I wanted to ask you was, I think that the bathroom issue, like you said, would probably be um, much easier to tackle 
Could you mind speaking for a few minutes about the locker room issue in schools? Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of trends intersecting here. Um, so first of all, uh, and I'm sorry I mentioned this to you guys earlier, but one of the cultural things in the United States that's happened over the last 50 years is we've decided to make good on this idea that public education was for all kids. And so we started knocking down segregation, haven't done a great job at that. We started knocking down barriers to people with disabilities, with IEPs and assistive technology, et cetera. So when trans kids came around, most schools' instinct was just to say, oh, well, more students we have to accommodate. And maybe they grumbled about it, but they knew they had to do it. And with trans kids, it's really easy, because all you have to do is just, the only accommodation is keep the adults out of it, and the kids are fine. But another trend that's happening in schools is locker rooms are becoming more private. Um, and that, will, that trend will accelerate dramatically over the next few years, partially because of trans people, but also partially because the way, I, I'm not a child raising expert, but the way our kids are being raised now, they are apparently morbidly afraid of, they're, they're changing less in front of each other anyway for lots of reasons. And they're not used to it and they think it's outrageous and more and more schools are starting to accommodate that. Um, trans people, the ones I know, have not been looking you know, for exciting places to show other people their genitals. Um, but if you don't allow a kid to use a locker room at school, it means maybe they can't do phys ed. You know, they don't do showers in phys ed at almost any schools anymore, apparently, which I vote for. I mean, I vote for no showers. That was just horrible. Um, and I think that that trend is going to accelerate and partially because of trans students. There's not a lot of, and, and you, you do things like you wear shorts, you know, and trans kids are not waving their genitals around. I don't know how else to say that. It's, um, it isn't happening to, you know, trans kids, for the most part, I know there's always outliers, um, are actually genuinely very modest. Um, we, we as trans people often say, when it comes to locker rooms and bathrooms, we're more afraid of you than you are of us. Um, now again, that's not true of all people, um, but again, has anybody ever heard of trans kids exposing themselves to other kids in the locker rooms? It doesn't, it doesn't happen. But if they can't be on sports teams, or if they're, everybody knows they have to use the bathroom in the nurse's room to change and stuff, it sets them aside. It sets them up for ridicule and bullying. And it's just not, um, it's just not OK. And we have to come to an accommodation about it. If I, if I may, I mean, I think the big bugaboo is you know, keeping people, parents, um, from listening to sort of ignorant rhetoric out there, you get the Ted Cruz's of the world sort of talking about the Rene Richards model. Here's a, a man who has transitioned to be uh, identified as a woman going in and playing what lacrosse or, or, or what the, uh, tennis hockey or some such thing, women's tennis. And so I'm just, I'm wondering how worried you are that this kind of thing is going to be put in front of you as something that, that blunts your progress. Um, it will be put in front of us, and it may slow us down a little. We'll get through it. It's kids playing games, for gosh sakes. And most schools get that. Um, we do have more of a problem with locker rooms than bathrooms, so it may be a strategic point on my part to focus more on the bathrooms than the locker rooms. Um, but we'll win the locker rooms, too. Thanks. Um, I just wondered if you're making any common cause with other groups of people that need uh, bathrooms not to be so divided, like anybody that has to attend to anyone else in a bathroom. It's not always the same gender. Yeah, screw them. No, I'm kidding. Um, so, they, yes. So, we, we are, there's several places where we're advocating model policies around things. And it's a little disingenuous because our model policies for most things are actually what's model for right now. Um, so there's a political science concept called the Overton window, which is the stuff that candidates can support without seeming too extreme. And what we're seeing now is a break that used to be uh, enforced by elites. And now it's being enforced by random people on the internet. And so there's a lot more play. So 
it's now apparently acceptable to show up at a political rally wearing a KKK t-shirt, where when I was coming up, you just wouldn't do that. Um, and, and so a lot of things, so a lot of bad things happen because of this, but a lot of good things happen about it too. And one of the ways in which we're, we have several levels of model policy is we are both trying to increase the number of gender neutral restrooms, while at the same time we're trying to um, allow access to people based on their gender identity. Um, the idea of gender neutral bathrooms is not just a good one. It's now built into the concept of universal design for buildings. When you build a building, you try to build it for everybody. And gender neutral bathrooms are really great for parents who have small kids with them. For people who aren't trans identified but might have a, a gender expression that causes alarm, usually in the women's room. Um, uh, people with disabilities, as you said, who may have attendant care. Um, so there's a uh, there's an understanding that gender neutral bathrooms are actually very helpful for lots of different people. So in Washington DC, they instituted a, a, a regulation now like seven years ago that all single use bathrooms had to be gender neutral. Uh, and Starbucks the very first day changed all of their bathrooms to gender neutral in their 52 restaurants and nobody noticed. You know, it's not like people are like, what, what? You know, it's, people don't notice that. But at the same time, we have to be, I personally don't think in my lifetime there will be no gendered bathrooms. Um, uh, so until then, we have to win access for people according to their gender identity. And we have to, a big challenge we have right now is framing it not as a choice. It isn't a choice that the eight-year-old trans girl uses the girls' room. She doesn't get to choose whether she uses the boys' or the girls' room. I'm, I'm developing now a theory that I call the ruckus theory. Like most people, most trans people certainly, want to use the bathroom that causes the least amount of ruckus. And um, that's hard for people who have a non-binary or gender non-conforming identity. Um, so yes, the answer to your question is yes, and I'll answer all things yes or no from now on. Um, <laughs> but it is, it's also true in a lot of the other work we do, for instance, around immigration detention. We're working specifically to uh, eliminate solitary confinement as a standard of detention. We're working to eliminate sexual assault, which actually percentage-wise happens to trans people a lot more often. But there's so many other people who aren't safe from sexual assault in immigration detention. So we always try to have our lens on about who else we're helping and who else we really, really can't hurt while we're doing our work. Hi, thanks for joining us today. Um, a question I have is I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about um, the anti-discrimination bill in Houston, the fight around that, all the money that went into it, and how um, like trans people using the correct bathroom was like used to like undermine other forms of like LGBTQ non-discrimination. Um, I know you said that the trans movement doesn't have a lot of money behind it, but a lot of money was put into Houston. So I was just wondering if you could talk about those types of trends. Sure. Um, so the HERO, which stood for Houston Equal Rights, um, uh, Ordinance, thank you. I was going to say official, and that didn't make any sense. Um, uh, would have protected about 25 classes of people, including veterans, pregnant women. And the people who I shall inappropriately refer to now as the bad people um, <laughs> wanted it dead. Um, they genuinely believe people should be discriminated against if you claim your religion says it's OK. Um, and the weak link there was trans people in the bathroom. So that's where they attacked. Um, the LGBT movement's policy has always been to pivot away from bathroom talk. And we got clobbered. I think we lost by like 35 points. And 35 points, there, there were, so there was, it was only a six week campaign, which it's hard to get momentum. But basically the, the other people, the aforementioned bad people, did an ad showing a man lurking outside of a bathroom in a public park and a little like five-year-old girl goes in and he looks around and then he goes in too. And it clobbered us. Um, nobody had been responding to the media. We've never until this year done campaigns. We weren't engaged in the Houston campaign. In fact, 
the day afterwards, reporters were calling us and they were like, we noticed you didn't sign on to be a member of the coalition. And I was like, there was, I didn't know there was a coalition. Um, you know, all the, we have this marriage equality infrastructure that has been pivoting to work on anti-discrimination laws. Um, so a lot of organizers and media people, and they just were doing this without input from the rest of us, and they, they fucked up. I say they f screwed up, sorry, but um, you lose by that many points. It means your fundamentals are all funky. It means it wasn't t a tactical problem. It wasn't because you didn't reach out to the right neighborhoods. or you know, there's, a, there's a lot of legitimate conversation that in a city that's 60% people of color, they really didn't have any people of color outreach plans, and that's, uh, that's bad. But even if they had, they would have lost. Um, they still should have, but they would have lost. Um, and that was the wake-up call for everybody. That was our wake-up call to not allow the marriage equality movement to take over that stuff. And we're now super duper engaged without any resources to do it, so that's fun. Hi, Mara. Hi, Tobias. So I wanted to know if you could talk a little bit about um, violence against trans women of color, particularly black women, and how NCTE may be sort of addressing that through policy initiatives. Sure. So last year was a traumatic year for trans people. We had, nobody knows the exact number, but something like 26 murders of, of trans women in the United States. And when you look at the photos of the trans women, the first thing you notice is all but one of them were people of color, and all but four of them were black trans women. Um, we live in a country where trans people are more susceptible to violence than trans people, but also um, black women are more susceptible to violence than other people. And young women are more susceptible to violence and low-income women are more susceptible to violence. So if you're a low-income trans woman, a black trans woman, it's got to feel like you have a target on your back half the time. And um, so that's what the problem is. Um, it's not an easy solution. There's a whole bunch of different solutions about um, uh, if, if you ask folks in that demographic, they'll basically say, there's no jobs. You know, I, so I'm economically in a neighborhood where that's more likely to happen. I'm in uh, sometimes, but certainly not even the majority of times, I may be engaging in an activity that I have to to survive that makes me more susceptible to violence. So we've done a couple things. So we've worked really hard to, to put this on the Obama administration's agenda. And there's a lot of activity, particularly in the Department of Justice. Um, doing things like there's a small agency called the Community Relations Service that any minute now is going to release a training video for police officers on how to interact with trans women. Um, we're trying to support trans women of color efforts that are s forming and speaking up. Um, and we're trying to get the federal government to study the problem. And that seems like sort of a weak ass kind of thing. Um, but we don't know how many trans people there are, let alone how many black trans women there are, let alone. So I think we all know that the murder rate is dramatically elevated for young, low-income black trans women. We don't know by how much, because nobody studied it. And if the federal government hasn't studied something, there's no money to mitigate it. Uh, and so we've been working really hard to try to get the federal government to think about how it can can do it. And the White House now has had, I don't know, four or five meetings of young trans women of color at the White House to talk about the problem, um, to talk about what the White House and the administration can do, and to sort of build up and boost those folks who can then go back to their communities and say, you know, I went to the White House, and here's what we have to do to get going. And so it, it is dramatically unsatisfying response. Um, and I think all of us are trying to figure out how to do it better. But it's not like anybody has a great idea yet. Um, you know, a lot of this is about machismo. A lot of it's about poverty. A lot of it's about um, um, objectification of trans people. So it's, um, it's a, a big, complex, messed up problem. And we're all trying to figure it out.
Hi, Mark. Hi, Vanessa. I think the last time we saw each other was in Denver at Creating Change last year. So it's nice to see you again. Thank you, you for well. coming. Um, you, you talked quite a bit about the restroom and locker room issues here tonight, which is, I, I believe, the next big looming issue that our movement needs to confront, uh, particularly on a legislative level. But I'm wondering what you think might be some additional concerns that uh, the movement is going to have to confront other than restrooms and locker rooms, that sort of thing. I happen to believe it's uh, the issue of uh, economic equality. Uh, I don't believe you can have social equality until you first have economic equality, and you can't have that without employment. So I'm wondering what you, you think about that and uh, you know, where you see us heading, uh, particularly legislatively, uh, beyond the restroom and, and locker room issue. Yeah. So do you know what's the single most important issue for trans people? It depends which trans person you ask. Um, and what we know is that there are trans people who they can't find a job. That's the most important issue for them. And there are trans people who just got thrown out of their families or their faith communities or their job. And that's their biggest problem. Um, so I completely agree with you. I believe we can no longer have a moral or an effective LGBT movement or a trans movement. And I, um, and I mean that, moral or effective. I believe we have an obligation to fight, but I believe that's worthless unless we also have an obligation to win. <coughs> so it has to be uh, moral and effective. <coughs> How about that glass of water we talked about? <coughs> Thank you. It's in my podium. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs> or I could do a Marco Rubio. <laughs> um, he'll be speaking here soon once he's out of the presidential race, which apparently is any day now. Um, so um, I think we can no longer have a moral or effective movement unless we also are an anti-poverty movement, and an anti-racism movement, and a pro-immigrant movement, and a pro-disability rights movement, pro-women's movement, and a pro-workers movement. Those are the things that, um, that are really impacting people's lives. Uh, not that we don't need a trans-specific movement anymore, but it has to be with those other things in mind. Um, the biggest problem for trans people right now is poverty um, for many trans people. Um, and it's poverty that's caused by you know, job discrimination or um, family abandonment or not being able to stay in school because of disrespect or discrimination. And we have to figure out how to do that better. So I agree with you. Ha, Bernie Sanders was here last week. He said that too. <laughs> it's not true. I wasn't here. I don't know. Oh. Hi, Mara. I'm John Pfeiffer from Chicago House. It's nice to see you here. Good to see you. My question for you is, um, what traction have you seen from leading political parties, campaigns rather, and what are your greatest hopes and objectives for this election cycle? Um, so we're a nonpartisan organization. So for instance, my dig at Marco Rubio just now was not aimed in a partisan way. It was aimed in a he's quickly becoming a loser kind of way. Um, and I mean that in an objective, nonpartisan way. Um, I, would, I, would, I would be satisfied with everybody leaving us alone. Um, you know, the truth is, I think there's some candidates, and I could identify them, who I think would be better for our work um, and what we still need to do for trans people than, than others. Um, some of them I would be disappointed in. Some of them I might be surprised in a good way. Uh, but the number one factor in our federal work that I'm looking at right now is what happens in the, in the presidential election. Um, the Republican National Committee in January did a resolution on asking states to pass bad bathroom bills, these bathroom attack bills, genital check bills for kids. Um, so that's pretty uh, messed up. Um, and it just is true. Whereas, you know, honestly, the two Democratic candidates 
are just tripping all over each other to be pro-trans, which is good. I think they both genuinely are pro-trans. Um, I would just hope that the people who don't like us leave us alone and then that they lose. Um, but I don't always know who that is. And I'll tell you, we're at the end of the time where we can get all of our work done with just Democrats. Um, it's never been true that we could always just do that. But we're getting down to states, you know, trying to pass state policies that um, we won't be able to do unless we understand, um, we understand that Republicans have to be part of our family too. I am, I am frustrated as all get out at how trans people are treating um, Caitlyn Jenner. She said some really messed up things, but what I know is over the next five, 10 years, a lot of prominent trans people are gonna come out and that's who the media is gonna to wanna to cover and there's gonna be some governors or Congress people or whatever. There haven't even really been that many gay governors, but there could be some. We know of trans state legislators who are deeply closeted, who have come up to some of us at various times and said, you know, I'm trans, but I want to run my career out first. Some of these people will start coming out and they won't all have um, political philosophies or approaches or presentations that keep us all happy. But, you know, Caitlin, um, while she has a bigger megaphone than other people, she has essentially the same political philosophy as 45% of the public, and I presume 45% of trans people. But we have, we, we are in a, I'm going to get into next week's thing. We're having a little freedom of expression, freedom of speech problem in the United States right now on all sides. Um, and we just have to, we just have to figure out how to do better about that. I, I don't agree with Caitlin much, but she's been undeniably good for us. The only bad things that's happened is she's annoyed trans people but she's educated America, so that's a net positive for me. She's annoyed me. I just don't care. I hate calling people like actual live people out on camera. I don't think I called her out, right? I did condemn all trans people in all circumstances. <laughs> what else, any other cool questions? Seriously? There's one. We, uh, the reason we're using the microphone is we want the questions and the answers to be on the tape. Oh. Apparently, it's going to be some movie. No, not really. <laughs> Nobody would watch this movie. <laughs> oh, look, it's Mara. Yeah. Um, I was just I wanted to ask you why you think that the marriage equality movement and the infrastructure built up by the marriage equality movement so far has not been Health is health has not been helpful to the trans movement the way you know we think that the, the way it ought to have been. So it it has been in a lot of ways. I think that that the LGBT movement um, convinced um, the media, the public, the legislatures, the president, and even our own community that marriage was the single most important goal of all time. I think that was a shame. I think it was an important goal. People wanted to get married. It was illegal discrimination that had to end. It didn't have to be our primary directive that used almost a quarter of a billion dollars. Um, you know, the trans movement has run probably on less than 15 to 20 million dollars in its whole history. And we just spent a quarter of a billion dollars on marriage equality. That's just our side. And, um, it's not that I didn't want us to win marriage equality. It's that I didn't want to do it with money flowing out of other efforts. Now, lots of new money came in also. And by the way, there were some big benefits to the marriage equality movement. America got to see us. It built our political power. Um, I, so I think there were some really big things. But then what happened was suddenly when marriage equality was won, and starting like a year and a half earlier, there were all sorts of LGBT groups who had been really um, built up by the marriage equality thing, they were like, holy crap, what's going to happen next? And we all started having conversations, what's after marriage equality? And I was, you know, always, it's not that different for the trans part of the movement yet. So we had all these people who had really cut their teeth on marriage equality doing state campaigns, like on ballot initiatives and legislative battles. And they 
it was a smart idea to repurpose them, and they got repurposed towards non-discrimination. Last year was the first year of that. The Houston ordinance was the first real test of that, and you know, it didn't work. That doesn't mean they're bad people or they didn't mean well. It just meant they were listening to the message people who all of along, all along have been saying, don't talk about bathrooms, we can't win that. Um, and now we all know that's out the window. We have to talk about bathrooms because that's all anybody else is going to talk about. So I don't think they're bad or incompetent or messed up people or a system. They just also started on things like the Hero Campaign in Houston without any trans leadership, without any real understanding of trans people. And that's being corrected really pretty quickly. So I'm very hopeful. And I would like a quarter of a billion dollars, please. <laughs> Thank you. Anything else? Anybody have to get to church? Hi. Um, in, there's this uh, particularly heinous type of, quote, therapy that's sometimes called conversion therapy or sexual re reorientation therapy where uh, it's trying to change your same-sex attraction. Yeah. And there's been some movements to get it banned uh, in, I think, successfully in California and New Jersey, they got it banned for minors. I think a few more states also. Oh, actually, oh, I didn't know that. Too. Oh, yeah, last year. Oh, awesome, <clears throat> <laughs> I didn't know that. Oh, Illinois also, you said? Yeah. Last year, last yeah. August. Oh, cool. So I was wondering if there's much of it, like, uh, gender, regendering uh, movement, and if you're doing anything to fight it, if that does exist. Yeah, so um, it's been really interesting. You know, there's, um, uh, when we first started trying to get the people working on conversion therapy and the therapists or the psychiatrists who knew about this to think about including trans people in the struggle, they were so, t the, the actual definition of conversion therapy is a sexual orientation definition. So they were like, but this doesn't happen to transgender people. But if you've, if you've read about it or you've seen any of these movies, a lot of it really is about gender and gender presentation. And you know, if you just played football, you wouldn't be a gay homosexual. And um, uh, I think, this, so, so now the conversion therapy thing more regularly or commonly is thought to include both sexual orientation and gender identity. Uh, and a lot of it's sort of the same, a lot of it is sort of the same stuff. I am not an expert on it, and actually we don't do a lot of work on it, not because it's not important, but the National Center for Lesbian Rights is leading that effort. Um, and some of the other groups like the Trevor Project and, and GLSEN, and, um, they don't really need us, and they're doing a perfectly fine job without us. So. We're doing other things, and, and we're going to win that. There's been a really neat thing. The Southern Poverty Law Center came up with this idea to use anti-fraud laws, um, business anti-fraud laws. And they're going after therapists and psychiatrists now saying, you're promising to cure their children. That has been proven by your, indus your uh, industry or your profession that it, it is not possible. Therefore, you are defrauding these parents. So we were going to put you out of business. Uh, and Congressman Ted Lieu from LA has introduced a bill. Um, so it's like Federal Trade Commission stuff. It's way outside of my legal expertise, what with not being a lawyer and all. <laughs> Though I did take the LSATs in 1986. <laughs> so that's something. So it's really important. We're going to win that too. But kids are still being hurt and parents are still being knuckleheads. Hi. Uh, I think you mentioned non-binary and gender fluid groups earlier. Can you talk more about those subgroups and the challenges facing them? Um, and if yeah. your organization does anything specifically for those groups? Yeah, absolutely. So um, just to make sure everybody's up to speed, um, not everybody identifies as a man or a woman or a boy or a girl. Um, there is a growing percentage of our general population and of the trans population that identifies as lots of different words are used, gender queer, gender fluid, non-binary, that is a binary of male and female, and they're like, screw that, I'm outside of that binary. 
um, gender queer. I don't know if I said that one, but there's there's a lot of things. And five years ago, we did the National Trans Discrimination Survey, and 11% of our sample identified that way. Six years later, we did the US Trans Survey this summer or fall, and we'll have a report out in early summer. Um, but we're now seeing that numbers jump from 11% to 37% of trans identified people, um, most of whom are under the age of 25. Um, and we see things like most of the studies, the very few studies, uh, that are population based studies of adults in the United States have shown that uh, 0.3 of 1% people identify as trans. But school districts in LA, or sorry, San Francisco, Madison, Wisconsin, and Boulder, Colorado, and Boston now have done studies um, of their students and how they identify, and 1.5 to 1.7% of kids are identifying as trans. And a big chunk of them are identifying as non-binary, um, maybe using they pronouns instead of he or she pronouns. Um, and it is a quickly growing part of our population, and we're trying to figure that out. So we always, in any of the policy work we're doing, try to think about how our work will impact that. So in these bathroom conversations we're having, we can't say, we agree with you, America. Boys should be in the boys' room and girls should be in the girls' room. That's what we're saying, too. We can't say that unless we also say, but you know what? We all know of people who don't fit in any bathroom really well. It's not that. It's not just that they don't feel comfortable, it's that they, they aren't safe. Maybe they're a, um, somebody who's identified as a woman who just doesn't fit visually into the women's room. Or maybe it's somebody who just has a, an appearance. So we have to be explaining non-binary people. So it's a, a really core part of our bathroom conversation we're having. Um, and that's tricky. It, it makes it a trickier thing. But I think it's going to make it a more effective thing. And but all of our policies are about this. Uh, you know, we're we're working with IDs, um, and we're trying to get people to be allowed to have the right ID. And one of the big challenges we're having now is a lot of non-binary people who are coming forward and saying, "We want an, an additional marker. We want F and M and O for other, or N for not sure. I don't think that's one, but there's N for I forget what N stands for. Um, and when I want to say to them, it, it may be non-binary. I don't know. Um, I want to say to them is, no, 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 that's an intermediate, it's another intermediate step. We don't need that. We need to get gender marker off of these things. That will help non-binary people. That will help trans people. It makes a lot of transsexual people nervous because they rely on their driver's license to prove that they are now a man or prove that they are now a woman. Um, but in the big picture, it'll be better when IDs aren't about that. Um, so we're working a lot on ID stuff and on healthcare access. We're trying to make a lot of the healthcare system is set up as boys and girls and, and based on a cluster of parts. And we're trying to get people to, to understand that. So we take it into account and I think we're doing pretty well. I don't think we're doing good enough or well enough, whichever one is an adjective or an adverb, whichever is the one I should have used. I think I'm going to go with good. Thank you. Nicole has a question up front. Thank you so much. Um, I know that the term cisgender has had a variety of proponents and opponents, particularly in the academy. I know there's been a lot of debate about whether it's protective or whether it's creating new binaries. But I'm curious from the perspective of the legislative process. Do you find it to be a useful term? Um, I've noticed you haven't used it tonight, and I was curious if you find it to be useful, effective, or not really helpful. NCT has never used it once. Um, it is not a term that anybody in America understands except us. Um, it's it become sort of a shibboleth. Um, I watched an Arizona State Senate hearing two years ago. It was about bathrooms. And hundreds of people on our side lined up. And they would get up there and they'd say, I'm a cis ally. And the senators were like, I do not know what the fuck that is. <laughs> and, um, and it quickly moved from cisgender to cis. And nobody has any idea what we're talking about. 
And there is not an advantage in the world for me to try to explain this to a United States senator or somebody in the administration. I, I personally, and keep in mind, I am old, right? I'm 56, and there's a lot of stuff on my lawn, and I want it off. <laughs> so this is one I don't, I don't see an advantage to it at all. Um, I think it is, you know, a nice happy word that the overprivileged, overeducated queers said, let's invent new words. And they keep changing new words. This is what's going to get me purged, this <laughs> conversation here. Um, and I just don't get it. I, I don't think it's a useful term. And we at NCTE, because we're educating the policymakers and we're educating the public, we can't just throw out words and bring in new words like the rest of the trans community seems to think is helpful. I get that the words are really important. I really do get that. Um, but you know, this trans asterisk thing was what everybody was doing for about a year. And then people were like, that is so insulting. And it wasn't insulting. It was gimmicky. And so we, we also don't believe it's, we have uh, the right to be controlling the language trans people use. So we're always late adopters of new words. Um, so that we don't, because we have a bigger voice than most trans people. We collectively as an organization have uh, a bigger voice. So we don't want to be making language decisions for trans people. But cisgender, I don't get it. I think I've lost this. I, I mean, I think I've lost this one. Um, so maybe we'll start using it, but I don't get it. Um, and you know, everybody can sit around and say, oh, well, we're reclaiming and we're all in I think that's a little self-indulgent. And that last couple of words is what will get me purged. <laughs> Susan, you look like you want to respond to that particular thing. Chemistry major. I thought I invented the word cisgender about five years ago when I found out everyone else invented it. <laughs> <laughs> and he signed it for that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's interesting. Yeah, but if it's OK, I'd like to tell people it was you. <laughs> it was like somebody I went to college with. Yeah, it is. You're right. It's a chemical term having to do with cells that line up or you know, something. Yeah, I think it's shenanigans. Oh, and by the way, what it means is non-transgender. Do you know what another word for that is? Non-transgender. <laughs> We've had two people call our office and identify themselves as non-cisgendered. Honestly, I don't know what to make of that. <laughs> Yeah, somebody said, I'm working here in wherever it was for non-cisgendered rights. So we, we put up on our little whiteboard, non-cisgendered equality now. <laughs> so I don't get it. I, I don't get it. And I know it's really important to people, but they haven't convinced me. Or the Arizona State Senate. <laughs> Anything else? Um, we have an eight-year-old, and uh, she just wants to play girls softball. And um, there's, there was sort of this problem when we went to register her that they wanted her school records and her birth certificate uploaded. And I was really challenged um, because she's not out and doesn't want to be out. And I really had no interest in talking to you know, the dad who's in charge of the league and having him go talk to the board, which was the other 10 dads in the league. And um, so I kind of struggled with what to do. And thankfully, her school um, district allowed her to register as female. Um, but her birth certificate does not read the same. So I kind of struggled with that. And we ended up uploading something that didn't say what it had said before. So I'm, but we're, we're struggling with what to do. Um, with legal documents for um, minor children who um, may still be figuring things out. In our case, I don't think she is, but that could change at puberty and other you know, times later on. So a lot of us parents are struggling you know, from the ages of 2 to 18 with how to best support our children and to help them navigate this very complicated um, path yeah. of requirements and adults and judgment and things like that. So I was wondering if you had any insights or thoughts about that on how to navigate things along this kind of weird legal and documented route for children. Yeah. 
So I'm, I'm not an expert on this, I will say. But what I do know is from reading studies that the single most important thing for kids is family acceptance um, by far. And that can help insulate them from a lot of crap. Um, second, I'll add for you a little philosophy from my son when a basketball coach was being a jerky jerk face to him. And I had to explain it to him. And he said, so what you're saying is people are the dumbest people there are. So feel free to use that one. Um, I don't, you know, it, it depends a lot. Um, I have a friend who has a 16-year-old in the DC area, and they've chosen to just change everything. Um, I don't know what the Illinois rules are about changing things like birth certificates. I do know, and I'm not advocating what is right for your daughter, because I don't know, but the sooner you change things, the least likely they are to come back and you know, ricochet around later in her life. Um, I, and, I, you know, I am not a child psychologist or a child expert in any way. I'm just somebody who had a kid or has a, has a kid, but he's an adult now. Um, you know, she's not going to grow out of it. And you know what? If she does, deal with that. Um, you know, it, it's changing a birth certificate is clearly not a final thing. It's not possible in Illinois. OK, I didn't know that. By the way, we have an ID documents center. Pardon me? Yeah, that's surgery. Yeah, well, that'll be fixed someday soon. But we have an ID documents. You can do it in Illinois, but it's kind of um, policy, uh, policy wonky shenanigans. Um, the ACLU had a case a few years ago. Um, you just have to have what's quote unquote an operation, but there are doctors who are willing to sign off on it. say that hormones constitute an operation since the term operation is intentionally vague. Mm -hmm. um, but there is currently a bill in the Illinois uh, legislature that would make it so people could just change the birth certificate. Yeah. We're about to pass one in Colorado. So it'll change. But I, um, I, again, I, I don't know what's right for your daughter, and I'm not going to give you advice. Um, uh, so a high school friend of mine hunted me down. I hadn't seen in 30 or 40 years. And he has a 16-year-old trans kid. And he was on the internet. And he stumbled across my name and called me up. And he's like, we don't know what to do. What if it's not real? Like, and I'm like, so the kid goes to school for a little while? And you know, the kid's 16, right? And how do you know that the 16-year-old who's not trans is sure they're not trans, or as I say, cisgendered? Um, <laughs> um, uh, you know, even if you do things like change ID and change school records, just that you can do that proves it's not final. If your daughter is one of the people who untransitions, which is a teeny, every detransitioner I know did it for economic or exhaustion reasons. They were just tired of the discrimination and disrespect. Um, uh, I don't know of anybody who's like, Oh my gosh, what was I thinking? And, and you, know, you know the rule with kids, if they're persistent, consistent, and insistent. And, you know, and if they change their mind, go, go ahead and try to stop her or them or him. I think also for, for me, it's uh, less about the insistent, consistent, persistent, because um, she's all of those. But um, it's, for me, a struggle of her not wanting to be out. And um, I've been hearing a lot of really great talk and advocacy the last several months, and a lot of encouraging of us parents and other of trans people to tell their stories and to be real and uh, just let it all hang out for a while to have people know us. And um, it's challenging, I think, for, for many because they would rather just <laughs> for most. not have anyone know, right? Yeah, and just try most. and live your life. Um, and so I'm struggling as a, just as a parent of a minor child on, like, I, she has no interest in telling, talking to anybody about her situation. She just wants to be yeah. herself, um, as I guess anyone And would. that's, by the way, very smart yeah. on her part. Um, and so for me, the, you know, the softball example what, and registering for softball was really more, I guess I was, some people might encourage me to go, you know, maybe talk to the person at the top, and then I'm educating that person 
but then I'm also running this risk of outing my child. And yeah. it could just start, you know, and And the coach around. is only going to tell one person who's only going to tell one person. Yeah, it's a real hard call. And you got to make it as the, as the parent until she's old enough to do whatever she wants to do. But for every Jazz Jennings or Shannon Axe out there, there's a thousand kids who either them or their parents are like, no way. Uh, in fact, you know, Shannon, that's not her real name. Um, she's super out. She's doing modeling. And that's not her name. Um, and her mom uses a nom de trans. That's what I made up that term. <laughs> yeah. Not from chemistry either. That's a good term. Yeah, you've got to think about it. Um, and I would say about sports, by the way, the National Center for Lesbian Rights um, has a really great uh, LGBT sports program, and they are really at the forefront of the trans sports stuff. There's a woman named Helen Carroll who is spectacular. Uh, please join me in giving Mara Kiesling a very good. Thank you.